Hello, I'm Stan Crook, founder, chairman, and CEO of NLORM. Welcome to the NLORM podcast series. This is a podcast series that focuses solely, exclusively, on the needs of nanorare patients. That is, uh, patients that have a unique mutation that affects only them, or are a member of a, a, a tiny group of patients of less than 30 worldwide. <clears throat> Today, I'm privileged to have two guests. Luke Rosen is a parent of one of our patients, his seven-year-old daughter, Susanna. Luke has had uh, three successful careers. He is an actor whom you have probably seen in shows like Law and Order and Orange is the New Black and uh, you know, a number of other movies and, and media. Uh, and then when he learned that Susanna was ill due to a rare genetic disease, he founded a patient advocacy group, which he continues to lead. And in the process uh, of learning about Susanna's disease, he became such an expert that uh, he was asked to be vice president of patient engagement at Ovid Therapeutics. Recently, however, uh, he's taken a leave of absence from Ovid to focus exclusively on Susanna, his family, and his foundation. Our second guest is Dr. Wendy Chung. Dr. Chung is, is the Kennedy Family Professor of Pediatrics at Columbia University Medical Center, where she wears a, a, a large number of, of other hats, such as a precision medicine resource leader in the uh, Irving Institute, uh, chief of clinical genetics, and, and many other roles. Wendy received her MD uh, uh, degree from Cornell University Medical School and her PhD in genetics from Rockefeller University. She is a renowned uh, genetics uh, scientist and a medical geneticist and is unusual in the breadth of diseases that, and patients that she's dealt with, but has a significant focus on neurological diseases and in particular autism spectrum. Uh, she has contributed groundbreaking uh, genetics research and continues to care for many patients. She's won numerous awards and she is consistently recognized as, as an outstanding educator and for her commitment to medical and graduate education. Welcome to both of you. Thanks, Sarah. Really, it's great to have you. So Luke, I'm going to begin with you. Um, why, why don't you tell us about life um, before you had Susanna? Susanna? Thanks, Stan, and then thanks for having me here. It's a real pleasure. Um, before Susanna was uh, was Nat, our ten year old son now, who uh, was was three when Susanna was born. So it was uh, very, you know, that feeling of being a new new parent and running all over the place and not being certain if you're doing things right or or wrong. And um, I traveled a lot more than I I do now, and so uh, I was. Um, like you said, I was an actor for about 20 years and, uh, we had a, a very nice, uh, you know, sort of life on the West side of Manhattan and we had play groups and, you know, we were that, uh, we were, we were very fortunate to have Nat and, and of course very fortunate to have Susanna. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's before, before it was kind of, kind of normal. It was, a the old normal, we like to call it, because we have a new normal now, but it's the old normal. How did you and your wife, Sally, meet? Sally, so we met in college. We, we both went to uh, school in Connecticut. We met at Connecticut College, and she was uh, dating a good friend of mine. <laughs> He's uh, not a friend of mine anymore. <laughs> yeah. One of those, eh? Yeah. Yeah, and it, is she a performer, too, or doing she, does other things? Or Sally is an incredible... Um, in, incredible actress. She's wonderful, but she um, uh, doesn't care to admit it herself. She uh, Sally Sally um, writes cookbooks and is incredible in the kitchen. And um, that's yeah. Sally is a is a wonderful writer, and she's um, since slowed work down a lot. Uh, she cares. Um, you know, both of us care for Susanna uh, pretty much full time, but Sally is the is the person who keeps the engine running in our house for sure. So uh, now we're going to be talking about <clears throat> topics that um, are deeply personal and deeply painful, I'm sure. And so Luke, I very much appreciate your willingness to, 
to share all that with us. And, um, and I fully expect to cry somewhere during this uh, interview. And that is exactly as it should be. Um, our hearts should go out to people who are dealing with issues, particularly issues that affect their young children. So uh, Luke, uh, what happened? You know, how did your life change after Susanna? You've already begun to tell us that, but I'd, I'd really be interested in how you learned when you first began to worry that you, there might be something wrong, what, what, what you had to go through to get a diagnosis and, and then, you know, what, what, what you learned about the diagnosis and how, how you, how you proceeded from there. Yeah, it, it was a, a very, I say this, um, I've said this before and parents know that if parents have more than one child, you know, for the first kid, with Nat, um, I feel like I always say this to you, Wendy, but with, with, Nat, with Nat, if he had, uh, you know, a, a little rash, we would panic and run to the emergency room or something. Not quite. But with our second, with Susanna, you know, it was kind of like, oh, she's on her own timeline. You know, she'll she'll get there. Uh, but we started noticing uh, there, there were a couple of different moments where we noticed that things were really... Um, really not going in the right direction. And, and it was Sally actually in the, uh, had Susanna in the bathtub. And we used to do this thing where we would uh, say to the kids when they were in the bath, when they were babies, you know, kick, 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 kick. And we made a little song of it, kick, kick, kick. And Susanna just couldn't kick. She couldn't move her legs up like that. And Sally said, I think something's really wrong. And so that's when we went to, um, you know, first our pediatrician and then our neurologist. Um, and it became really clear that there was something um, significantly wrong with her health. Um, and the neurologist uh, at the time told us that <clears throat> we should, uh, you know, they were just very stumped. We did a lot of tests, um, MRIs, EEGs, everything. And the neurologist said that we should... Um, uh, you get genetic testing. And if Sally doesn't like me saying this, but, uh, if, if you're over a certain age, um, at, and we were, we lived in, uh, Parliament at the time. So we, the kids were born at Columbia and, you know, Columbia is where we went when someone fell and got stitches. But if you're over a certain age, when you're having a baby at Columbia, it's, uh, Geri what do they call it a geriatric pregnancy or something? And um, it, part of it is that you have to uh, get a certain amount of genetic testing done. Uh, very minimal, I now know. But um, so I thought when the neurologist, I said, oh, we've already done that. I, I didn't have a science background or don't have a science background. I said, we've already done that. We've, we've had the genetic testing. But they said, no, there's a more extensive um, way to do it. You have to enroll in this research study. Um, and so one night we were in the hospital and, um, for a, a couple of, couple of nights for something that was going on with Susanna and, um, someone came in and we, uh, enrolled in the research study and, you know, quite some time went by until we finally were able to, um, hear that she had a, a, a mutation in this gene KIF1A and we didn't know what that meant at all um there was a, a a moment when i was walking with her up amsterdam avenue and she had she had very low muscle tone as a baby um but her legs shot up like planks and were stiff and she was scared and crying and and that was the real moment where i i thought something's horribly wrong um and so sally and i after we heard uh the diagnosis, uh, KIF-1A, uh, we didn't know it, it was accompanied by a few research papers that did exist and they were very scary papers to have. They said things like early death and brain atrophy and uh, just these words that were really hard to digest. And I, um, I got this information before Sally did because I, you know, and so I, I came home and I 
I had this window of time where I, I knew, but Sally didn't know. And I wanted that window of time. So to keep going, cause I knew that what I was just going to have to say to Sally and tell her, um, what I had just found out and show her these papers was going to be, um, and it was, um, uh, quite literally heartbreaking. Um, and then we started researching. We didn't know anything about this. So we started doing our own research and somebody said, you need to find Wendy Chung. Um, so, so Luke, how old was Susanna when you first began to suspect there was a problem? Susanna was three, four months old when we saw something was just a, a little off, but not nothing that was um, uh, incredibly concerning until she was about uh, one, one and a half. Yeah. And and then uh, so how how long was it before? you found your way to uh, understanding that she had this unique mutation in this, in this gene, you know, nothing about. Uh, how long was it from when we, f when you first went to your pediatrician to when, Oh you yes. I know you mean that. So it, uh, it, unfortunately it took a long time. It took uh, about three months for us to um, get the results back from, and and that was because we, we, if we could do it all over again, I would have, um, you know, asked our doctor at the time to just prescribe or order us the test. Um, instead, being part of the research uh, uh, study that we were in, uh, that took a significantly longer than um, it would have otherwise. So we were, we had that, those three months were uh, really difficult because we were just waiting and we didn't know if we were ever going to find out what was wrong with her. Um, every doctor we went to told us they had no idea really what was going on. Um, and they could talk about the specific parts of her body, you know, well, an ophthalmologist would tell us that her eye was moving one way because of one reason. And then a neurologist would say, you know, she's having these, uh, this activity in her brain for one reason, but then no one could ever give us an exact, really, this is what is wrong. So that was about three months of, of not knowing anything and being really scared. Yeah, three months of terror and, and then watching your little child go to terrifying things like MRIs and all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know what people forget to tell, um, someone forgot to tell us when Susanna was getting her first MRI that um, after... Uh, as as she was getting sedated, um, they sh the baby shake a little bit, and the person who was doing that forgot to tell us that. And okay. and as Susanna's eyes were closing, I remember thinking, um, "Gosh, I don't want the last thing she sees before she goes under to see me crying," because I was um, yeah, it was scary, you know, to see that. But I imagine it's normal. And, and I'm sure you know now that you actually had a remarkably short period. The average time, according to the UDN data, the Undiagnosed Disease Network data to, for a, 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 a rare, a, one of these kinds of diseases to be identified and genetically characterized is something like eight years. And of course, the vast majority of patients are, are never diagnosed. And so... Um, you learned that she had this mutation and, and, and in a gene you didn't know about and, uh, and you found some papers that told you that things were bad. And so um, how, did, how did your son handle all that? Well, Nat, had, he was, you know, he was four and he, uh, we try to pre we we're very honest in our family and in our house, but there are certain things that we wanted to protect him from. Um, and he uh, he's an incredible incredible person. Uh, so he handled it in a way that was this is just my sister. This is how she gets around. This is how she um, you know looks. This is how she 
uh, acts. But then there were some really scary times where he had to see some things that um, there still are. Every month, you know, he sees uh, things that are, are very difficult that kids shouldn't see. And, uh, but he, he handles things. Well, he's, t- he's 10 going on 60, you know. Um, how's Susanna doing today? Um, today she's, today she's, she's actually, today is a really good day. She doesn't usually make it through an entire day of, of school. Um, we'll get a call from her aide, her, uh, her para, uh, who spends a a one-on-one aide spends a day with her. Um, we'll get a call that she's either had a seizure or, or, um, a bad fall or something, or she's just, you know, not engaging with anybody and she's uh, staring off and the the teachers can't get her back to you know back back so she has so she has seizures and she has muscle control and muscle weakness problems and and attention challenges and uh, and does she is she in having some developmental delays as well as a result of all these problems Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, Susanna is, uh, she's now started, uh, she doesn't, she, she could walk, um, several steps, uh, uh, just a matter of months ago, but now she started crawling, um, instead of walking and she spends most of her time in her uh, wheelchair. Um, but she is, does have, um, yeah, her, her cognition is, uh, certainly not that of a seven-year-old. You know, but she's she smiles a lot and she's very happy even when we know she's in pain. She's uh, incredible. Oh, she's beautiful, and um, that you know that's her life. And, yeah, uh, it shouldn't be, but it is. And so, um, you got to work like parents often do in trying to understand what was going on with Susanna, and and uh, uh, I, I would have to guess that you felt lost, the vocabulary was basically impossible to understand. And as you learned more, you got more and more terrified, huh? Absolutely. It was, um, yeah, the, the, the not knowing and still right now, every, uh, all the, just not knowing what tomorrow is going to be like for Susanna is really hard because she, every day is kind of an improv, right? She's, uh, if she has one night where she's, she has a nocturnal epilepsy more than epilepsy during the day. I mean, she has both, but um, if she has a night that's filled with seizure activity, then we know her day is going to be really hard for her, you know? Um, so she, uh, uh, her, her, she's very spastic now in her, her, her lower limbs. Um, she also has a uh, neuropathies in her, her hands and her feet. So she will, um, she is in a lot of pain in her hands and she'll wake up and in her own way. And she, Susanna has, uh, has words. She's, she can express herself and in her own way, she'll tell us that it feels like her, her, um, hands are burning on the inside and that's hard to, hard to have a kid wake up and yeah. So, so you meet Wendy and, 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 and you have a diagnosis and, uh, my guess is that your first question after that was, is there any treatment? Yeah, well, uh, uh, we we met Wendy because somebody had told us that w- Wendy was the person who could articulate this and tell us what was happening and maybe care for Susanna. And um, so I emailed Wendy and she emailed me back within minutes and asked if... Um, Sally and I wanted to come into her office and she could uh, explain the implications of what KIF-1A was and meant. Um, And so we did, early in the morning, we went to uh, Wendy's office at at Columbia and uh, we, I talk about this a lot and we were mentioning um, the elevator ride up there uh, was Sally and I were really, really anxious, of course, and it, Susanna wasn't with us. And so it was one of the first times that we were in the hospital without Susanna. <laughs> and we had this, you know, a moment where we were alone in, in, 
got to spend time together, but it was because that doesn't happen. You know, somebody has to be with Susanna 24 hours a day, you know, all the time. Um, and then when, and when the elevator did open and, and this is, I remember this just so clearly the, the people who were there, you know, there was a, a genetic counselor and a social worker and, and the nurse practitioner. Um, and Sally and I knew that, you know, we were about to hear something, um, that needed an army of people to help us with. Um, and we went into, uh, into this uh, smaller room, uh, near Wendy's office. And, and Wendy came in and told us and just very clearly and with this, this empathy that, uh, is really rare. Um, what to expect and that, uh, you know, there's not much known we could find maybe, um, 15 people in the world that had a mutation in, in kif one a and nobody with Susanna's at the time. Um, and that uh, Susanna, uh, that it was a neurodegenerative disease, likely with a progressive course and, you know, she would probably have trouble seeing what she does. She has vision problems. She'd probably be in a, in a chair. It was a real, we were, that was a hard conversation. Um, I can't imagine, uh, ever having that again, but it, it, it was, it was, there was a lot of crying and I, you mentioned my son, Nat, um, and this is the moment, uh, of all of this about Susanna's health and about this this diagnosis and when Wendy was telling us what to, uh, you know, what it was, the moment I remember most and is the hardest thing was um, I said in the middle of the conversation, how are we going to tell Nat? You know, how, how are we going to tell Susanna's uh, brother? about this how do you tell a kid this and wendy uh sorry <clears throat> and wendy looked at me and said he's going to be a remarkable young man one day so for some reason that's what i i remember most about <clears throat> uh this uh this moment of finding out uh, this devastating disease that sally had was, or that Susanna has was um trying to figure out how I was going to explain it to my son. And then um, <clears throat> uh, Wendy walked us out of the hospital. And, you know, it wasn't just a, here's the diagnosis, good luck. It was, a, you know, she walked us downstairs through the building um, and out into it, even right when we got into the taxi. And there was a hug and a and and I'll see you soon. And so we felt like we had um, this support that I now know not many people have, you know. Oh, and that's sadly very true. Luke, I want to move to Wendy, but I, I, I do want to ask one last last question. Um, and Lorem, what does it mean to you and your family that Susanna's application was accepted by Ann Lorem as a potential for treatment? Yeah, that's another moment that I'll never forget is when Wendy uh, was able to tell us that the, to to uh, it means everything, Stan. To that there's um, people are fighting for a treatment for her, and that, that it is actually going to hopefully become a reality, and that we might be able to change the course of Susanna's life. It's it's really hard. It's hard to watch Susanna's life right now. Um, and to think that there's going to be a, a, you know, there could be a treatment for her that would not make it as severe, not make life so hard for, for her is just beyond measure. Words can't describe it. It's hard to, it means everything to us, everything. And you're sophisticated enough to know that there are no promises of any sort that anybody could make at this stage. So it's... Uh... It's hope and hope for help, I, I suppose, is the way to think of it. It's, yeah, absolutely. We are so, the, the 
desperation is teeming through our out our lives and our house and and uh yeah it's it's a hope for something that uh we didn't think would ever uh be there and it is so yeah yeah you know just the hopelessness and isolation of patients that 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 we are trying to help is um is detrimental to health hopelessness is bad for health and and helplessness is terrible that's really well said it is it is grinding and that that hopelessness is is uh we're so thankful yeah well um and we at Ann Lorem feel privileged to have Susanna as a patient and to work with Wendy. And, you know, uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed and do our level best and we'll all work together for Susanna. And I would say that I think every patient should experience uh, the, the care that uh, Wendy displayed. And sadly, I think you're right, um, um, Luke, that in far too few t- times is that the case. So you are very fortunate in many, many ways in the midst of, you know, a tragic situation. Uh, so Wendy, I'm going to turn to you now <laughs> and we'll try to brighten up the conversation here, maybe. Um, um, so uh, uh, I know your background and of course I've admired your work, but I- I'm intrigued by how you do it. Um, how-, how do you how do you manage every day? Well, talk about clinic day, I guess. How, how do you manage seeing uh, so many patients who are in positions similar to Susanna? Well, uh, number one is I'm the one who's on the screen, but there's an army of people behind me. Um, that's the real magic to all of this. And so we have a caring team. Luke mentioned, you know, our genetic counselors, our nurse practitioners, our social workers. But even beyond that, we've got an army of scientists, uh, computational biologists, bench scientists, neuroscientists, um, both here and around the world who are all fighting for Susanna and all of Susanna's friends. Um, so as we do that, you know, I think we've learned. Uh, It's taken me in some cases 25 years how to figure out some of the things that I do. Um, But as we've done it, we've tried to scale ways to do it and put everyone to work. And so even though the team that I mentioned are, you know, paid people on my team, the rest of our team is actually our families. So families like Luke and and I want to give Luke a lot of credit. He has mobilized a very powerful community of families behind him. And it's together that we get these things done. Um, And as we do this, we, we all have a role to play and we all take feedback and we iterate and we get better and better as time goes on. And we have partners like in Lorem, which I can't, I mean, I, I'm really good at some of the things that I do, but I can't do what you guys do. And together uh, it's the dynamic, not just duo, but dynamic. I don't know what a million people is, but it's a lot of us all working together. Um, and the hope is that although, you know, what we're doing for Susanna is important exactly for Susanna, the lessons that we're learning for Susanna, I'm convinced scale beyond Susanna. And so it's how can we do this, not just for Susanna, but Susanna's friends in KIF-1A, other 500 or so neurogenetic conditions that I think about, the 7,000 other rare genetic diseases that we know about, plus the others we're just discovering. Um, I think those are really the incredible opportunities, but it's tough because right now, um, you know, Susanna is one of very few individuals with exactly her genetic change, and we need to target her genetic change in this case. And so she really is... um, more than one in a million, you know, probably one in 50 million. Um, But that doesn't mean we leave her behind. It doesn't mean that at all. And, you know, I I think, uh, I I think you handle these things as, as I handle them and as as Luke and, and parents and, and patients do. And that is you find ways to take control of what you can control and find ways to accept those things that you can't, you can't control. Otherwise, otherwise, the process is too destructive. Um, I imagine that rings pretty true to you, Luke. Yeah, it does. It's, 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 um, it's pretty hard not to be able to control, uh, the outcome of the day or just, you know, what is happening next and, and that loss of control and lack of, um, direction or the spontaneous things that happen in life are, 
uh, really hard. But like Wendy said, we have this, you know, community of people who are uh, just so supportive and yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot. There was one, Wendy has been kind enough to invite us to speak once in a while to every year to her, uh, medical students. And, um, uh, this year was, was pr- pretty awesome, uh, because it fell on a, uh, voting day. So the kids didn't have school. So Nat and Susanna came too. Um, and I never want Nat to know what the word degenerative means, although he's getting old enough to see that things are getting changing with her, her sister, but or his sister. But, um, I had told Susanna, I wanted to prep her for what was happening. And I said, they'll, you know, there'll be a microphone that one of us will have. And, um, Wendy, um, brought Susanna, pushed Susanna's wheelchair in and, and, um, Susanna came and took the microphone and, um, and she sang a part of the, uh, song from Frozen. Uh, and it was in front of, you know, I don't know how many students were in there, but, you know, it seemed like a lot. And she had this auditorium full of 200 students all watching Susanna perform. It well, she's a, from a family of performers, so naturally she's going to be a star. Yeah, but but uh, yes, uh, she is. And but but seeing seeing her do that is not something. And I I never sell her short. I know she can do anything she wants to do. But there are things where you know you think about, uh, am I ever going to get to see my daughter do dot dot dot. And as I was sitting there watching her, even though we were talking to these medical school students, I, I somebody said, "Did you take a picture? Did you record it?" And I said, "No, I just lived it. I got to see my daughter sing a song to a big audience. It was, uh, that was another great gift. So thank you, Wendy." So Wendy, uh, why don't you tell us about the the gene uh, Kif one and and what what it does, what the protein does, and and why. Uh, Susanna is sick. Right. So uh, Susanna has a genetic variant. Um, it started brand new with her. Uh, it wasn't inherited from either Luke or his wife, Sally. Um, and the gene itself is a kinesin. It's a molecular motor. So it's responsible for taking things down these very long axons uh, or these very long projections out of neurons that go all the way from her head and the neurons in her head, but also the ones that go through her spinal cord and go down her legs to her toes and out to her fingertips. Um, those very long, uh, if you think about it, the length you have to go from your head all the way down to your big toe, it's a long way to go. And so those motors are responsible for going a long, long way. Um, and with this, Susanna's motor doesn't work very well. Uh, it has trouble in terms of, if you think about a train, sometimes it, it stalls on the tracks, it gets stuck and there's a traffic jam. Sometimes it falls off of the, of the tracks and you know it sort of loses its way in that way. And with that, um, without being able to deliver the cargo of those trains, um, those cells die. They die over time. And once they're gone, um, I can't say for 100% sure, but I'm 99% sure they're not coming back. And so as Luke described this, this is unfortunately a one-way street. And uh, the Luke and the families um, have a very obvious hashtag when you think about it, hashtag stop the clock, um, because that's what we think about in terms of time is ticking. And um, once we start you know, losing some of those cells, they don't come back. Um, Susanna has this neuropathy or this painful feeling that she has, the burning. Um, Susanna describes it, and some of the older patients have described it for me as well. It's a burning sensation that really hurts. I mean, like deeply hurts in terms of your hands and your feet, and just feeling tight, feeling like you can't really relax relax or let go. Um, And with that, it's just, it's a painful, uncomfortable feeling. And we try medications. We try some of the same medications we use for other patients who have what we call neuropathies or these uh, problems with their nerve cells, but it never really completely goes away. And and at times it gets worse than other times. So that's part of it. Um, But we literally, and I know this is hard 
for you to hear Luke, so I'm sorry about this, but um, we literally see Susanna losing cells over time. We can image her brain. Uh, we can, that MRI that Luke described, we can look at her brain. We can see parts of her brain that are shrinking where we're losing those cells and, and they're dying off. We can look in her eyes. We can see her optic nerve going to her eye. We can see those cells dying off. Is she, is she losing sight then? Yeah, she's losing sight. And it's so hard for Suze. I mean, she's such, she really is my heroine, but it's so hard for her because she's got so many things battling against her. Um, she has trouble with the spasticity, being able to move, but she wants to be a kid, right? She wants to just play and have fun. And you can imagine sometimes because she's not seeing things out of this, you know, corners of her eyes or seeing them clearly enough. Plus she has trouble in terms of moving and she has trouble with her balance. Um, she falls a lot more than other kids do. And sometimes Sometimes when she falls, she doesn't know what she's going to fall into. And so um, it's just hard. Susanna's broken bones, more bones than her collarbone, her arm. And, you know, when she breaks a bone, it's so hard for her because then she's immobilized and it makes it that much harder for her to get back to where she was. And so she has these, you know, it's sort of declining, but then, you know, it's almost like a big step down and she's got to work, work, work to just try and get anywhere close to where she was, but it's hard. Um, within that, there's also been this other major, major problem, um, which is that in terms of in her head, she's just got an electrical storm, the, the seizures and other words that are going on. And um, again, I don't, I, I hate doing this to you, Luke. So, but it's it this is no joke um we've had we we have just an incredible community but we've lost so many of our children to this disease and we've lost them due to some of these seizures uh in some cases unexpectedly and i know that's what scares us to death is and and i know luke and sally are just if, if you can imagine i don't think they've gotten a good night's sleep um you know since Susanna was probably, I don't know, two and a half, three years old, um, because uh, we do, we've had kids that we've lost to seizures in the middle of the night. And so uh, literally Luke and Sally, one of them is sleeping with Susanna. Um, in some cases, Luke mentioned Nat. Matt's had even an occasion to be the big brother in terms of sort of being the angel watching over Suze as she's sleeping. Um, and in some cases having a seizure or throwing up or having something caught and having to literally um, be able to make sure that she doesn't choke on her own vomit or that she doesn't have a seizure that she doesn't wake up from. And it scares us because we've had kids that we've lost that way. Um, as Susanna goes through this, as Luke said, you know, we haven't, we, we've tried just any number of medications for Susanna's seizures. And she's on a cocktail of medications. It's not just one, but it's a cocktail and it changes. It's not like you get it and you find the right mixture and you're good to go. It's like you might be good to go for a few months and then it's all over again, trying to figure out what this is and making it so that she's not a zombie because you know there are some of these medications that are sedating and then she's just out of it. And that's not a life. You, know, you want her to be a kid, um, but you also don't want to lose her or have her so that she's having so many, we call them post-ictal periods, but times after a big seizure that she's just out of it for that reason. So it's just, I, I can't tell you, it, it's a hard life. Um, Susanna has many, I think of them as angels watching over her besides her family. Um, she's got her service dog, Pippin, who's just, it's amazing. I mean, Pippin's a great for, I think a great therapy dog for Suze in general, but she's got her age, she's got teacher, she's got therapist. I mean, it literally takes an army, um, but even still, there is a team hovering over Susanna 24 seven. I kid you not, it really is 24 seven to be able to keep her safe. And um, I have to say though, on the other hand, Susanna is just a joy. I mean, it is a joy to see the things when she gets to eat an ice cream sundae or celebrate her birthday or be able to go, you know, it's ice skating, but it's Susanna's form of ice skating at this time in terms of being able to go to the beach and just enjoy looking for shells or um, playing hockey or doing a car wash. I mean, it's just, I, I feel like I'm, even though I don't get to spend as much time with Susanna under COVID, I get so many pictures and videos that I get to be a part of the extended family, that it's just, it's that joy that it motivates me and my team to do what we do every day um, because it's it's allowing kids like Susanna to live their richest, fullest lives. And, and we want to make them actually have those lives. Um, that's the painful part every time we see her take a step back. Yeah. Uh, why don't you spend just a minute on how uh, we hope to treat Susanna and why you, you, you think it might work? Yeah. 
So uh, as I was talking about Susanna and these trains going uh, down the train tracks, Susanna has one version of the gene that's perfectly fine. Those trains, I think, run on time, they run on schedule, uh, but she's got another copy of the train um, that is clogging things up. It's, it's making a traffic jam, it's causing problems. And so essentially what we need to do, ironically, is get rid of one of her genes, um, be able to get that train out of the way, let the traffic flow and be able to keep, maintain the health of those nerve cells. That's a tough order. Uh, we don't have, you know, a medication. I can't just say, you know, take two aspirin and call me in the morning. I don't even have something like the seizure medications. There's nothing we know of currently in terms of just a regular pill that you can take for Susanna to either treat the symptoms effectively or to get at the root cause of the disease. And that we know that if we don't do something to get at the root cause, um, she will continue to go downhill. With this, the, the sort of, just to put it in simplistic terms, um, the ASO that Enlorm is developing is going to be able to suppress or to be able to prevent that bad KIF-1A from being made, or at least decrease it to such a low level that it's not going to cause the mischief that it's causing. It's a tall order, and I, and I want to emphasize, this is like, this is not a trivial thing to do because we have to get rid of that, the bad KIF-1A, while maintaining the good KIF-1A because we need those trains to still keep going down the train tracks. Um, we've got a team of people uh, at Lorem, and I do have to say a lot of my confidence is built in my history with dealing with another rare disease community called spinal muscular atrophy. And so a lot of the playbook that we've taken for KIF-1A is built on the antecedent about 12 years that we had experience with SMA. And that same strategy worked in terms of um, Stan, uh, you should take a lot of credit for this one, uh, because for this with SMA, this was our first FDA approved treatment for SMA. And I can't tell you how many children I buried with SMA before we had the ASO treatment that we had with that. And so it was that inspiration that really convinced me that we had a chance with KIF-1A. And I, I don't say it's a guarantee, but we've got a chance in terms of going forward. And it's with that, um, that I really do think the strategy should work. Scientifically, it makes sense. Um, Stan and all of the other scientists at Enlorm have just an incredible insight to the chemistry of how this works and to be able to design what are very, very specific molecules to be able to do this without being toxic, without doing any damage, and to fine tune this in just the exact way that we need. And they've been so incredibly generous to literally donate all of that incredible experience and knowledge um, in the direction of children like Susanna. And there's, I can tell you, I, I know a lot of things. I don't know this. I don't know this chemistry. This isn't something that any scientist like any one of us could do just by thinking hard enough or, you know, um, sort of working enough of it. It really takes the decades of experience uh, that Stan and his team have. And it's us working together with KIF1A.org, with the other families in terms of all making this work. And, and I'm convinced we're on the right road. I am too. And, and, and being involved with Spinraza, our drug for spinal muscular atrophy was one of the many high points in, in my long career. But what we're doing at Enlorm is um, even more gratifying to those of us who are doing it. And, and so, you know, the one thing that we have going for us with these nano rare diseases is they're all genetic. And, and so once we understand the mutation, we have a potential target. And now with, with ASOs, we have genetic medicines. And so we can take that information directly and translate it to a medicine that we can use to treat a patient like Susanna. And, you know, to try to do that in 12 to 15 months, start to finish is a real challenge. And especially in these more complex um, the uh, mutations where we have to be very specific for one form of uh, one L one part of the two part gene system. So it's challenging, but uh, I think the technology is up to it. And, and I also believe that it has to be scalable. And if we take a commitment, make a commitment to a patient, we have to be ready to treat that patient for life. And we are, and we can do that. We can do it for free. And we are. Um, so uh, uh, again, uh, Luke and Wendy, it's just a great privilege to know both of you. And I want to thank you for um, sharing all this with us. Before we close, I, Luke, uh, uh, any, any final comment that you want to make? 
Yeah, I, I you know, I just thought of um, about three years ago, uh, I, I, I took this video um, of our son, Nat. Susanna was in her chair, and Nat was teaching Susanna how to throw a coin into a, um, you know, into, into water to make a wish. And he explained it, you know, you have to throw it this way, and then you make a wish, but don't tell anybody what that wish is. And then um, she threw it, and it got in there. And uh, I emailed that video to Wendy. I said, look at this, Nat's sending, uh, you know, teaching Susanna how to make a, a wish. And Wendy just wrote back one sentence. And that sentence was, I know what my wish is. And it's my wish too. And Stan and your whole team, I think, you know, you're, you're working so hard to make that wish come true. So thank you. Wendy, any final comment? No, just to say that um, it, it's not easy. Um, I know it's not easy for Luke and Susanna and Sally and Nat every single day. And we're there behind you. Um, there are different things that we do to support Santa, Susanna. And together, we're a really powerful team. And I know we're going to be able to get to something better. Well, uh, let me, I can't think of a better way to close this. We are all in pursuit of something better. Children should not suffer. And so we'll do our best. So I want to thank both of you very much. It's been a wonderful privilege to have you share all this with us. And, uh, and, and, and I'm sure we'll have, we'll have more opportunities to talk in the future. And I look forward to them being much more positive. So do I. Too. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dan. And Lorem is a nonprofit committed to discovering and providing personalized experimental treatments for free for life to patients with genetic diseases that affect 1 to 30 patients worldwide, referred to by Enlorem as nano rare. Many of these patients progress and die without ever achieving a diagnosis. This is where Enlorem comes in. They do the impossible by providing hope, and for those that they can help, free lifetime treatment. For more information about Enlorem or today's episode, visit enlorem.org. Any questions can be sent into podcast at enlorem.org. Search Enlorem on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Facebook to connect with us. This video is hosted by Dr. Stan Crook and produced with the help of the following professionals. Thank you for watching.